Okay, good morning. Uh, I've been instructed to tell you all to go and download the Wikimedia app. Uh, um, so welcome to this session on Open Scholarship. Uh, I'm Stuart, your session host, and we have two talks this morning. Um, there's going to be a panel discussion on open access and Wikipedia, moderated by Melissa Hagerman. Uh, but first, let's welcome two people who have been heavily involved in open scholarship for a while and are now both work at open access publishers. So Cameron Nalon is the uh, Advocacy Director at PLOS and one of the original signatories of the Altmetrics Manifesto. And Ian Mulvaney has previously been involved in building Conatia and Mendeley and is now Head of Technology at eLife. And they're here to talk to us about the, the fount of all knowledge, Wikipedia as a front matter to all research. Okay, so, so with that kind of modest, modest title, and thank you for, for coming out at 9.30 on Saturday morning. Um, we wanted to talk about this concept, this idea of, of, um, of Wikipedia as a route into and out of uh, the research literature. And we're going to have a couple of slides um, just to sort of set the, set the session up. Um, and then we're really looking for your ideas about how to um, how to do this, how to achieve this, and how to, how to realise this vision. So with that, I'll, I'll run the slides, I guess, and, and Ian's going to start. Okay, so um, 
thought it would be good to try and give a description of what front matter content is in the context of scholarly literature. So you're all probably familiar with um, research articles which get written by academics that get sent into the journals. There's an editorial process, they have a uh, peer review goes through, and then they get published, and that's a piece of research and contribution to, to our collective understanding of the world. But some journals, quite a few, have this other part of their journals that they publish, which they call front half matter. And front half matter is not necessarily peer reviewed, um, but talks about the peer reviewed literature. And that's what we mean by uh, front matter content. And I think what's interesting about that front matter content is there's a moment in the process where someone makes a decision on what is going to be that front matter content. Because it can be a feature article where you go and ask another scientist to write a commentary on a piece of research, but they need to get access to that piece of research before it's published. Or it could be where you commission an interview with the um, author of a paper, and it gets put up on, as your podcast. Or it could be where the news teams are scouring the literature and they've made a decision that something is newsworthy. But all of these moments are taking place inside these editorial offices of these journals. And they, in a way, bless some part of the literature. And so they decide, this part of the literature we're going to bless by adding this extra material around it. And that's something that happens from inside of the, the editorial offices. And those pieces of front matter content, they'll often contribute to getting your picture from your article onto the front page or the journal cover of that journal and gives the author that sense of prestige and feeling of, oh, good, I did a good job here. Um, and it can drive you know, up to 30% more traffic down to the original research as well. But there's nothing in that process which is provably saying that that research is actually better than any other research. It's just uh, this very human decision at that moment in time. And so when we talk about front matter, we, we, we generally are meaning the kinds of things that occur in the research literature, in those journals in one form or another. And I've shown you some examples from philosophy life as well as a, a podcast here. I want to make the argument that this is also front matter. So this is the uh, Wikipedia article for a particular species of monkey called um, Lesula. And the interesting thing about this Wikipedia article, so in fact actually gets a lot of traffic, um, is that it appeared completely independently of the publication of the research article describing this monkey, but it appeared in Wikipedia within nine hours of the article being published. Someone who knew that, they could take the material from that research article, they could take pieces of it, they could take video and images and audio in this case, it turns out the monkey makes a funny noise, and create an article. And, and that article has had a lot more views than the research article, but it's a significant driver of traffic from Wikipedia to that research article. And so the real, the, the crux of the point I want to make here is that creating front matter in the traditional sense, commissioning someone to write an explanation or a summary or an editorial about a piece of research to explain it to a broader audience is an expensive process and, as Ian has said, a selective process. And yet we have this amazing resource where this explanatory material is being curated and managed and created on a day-to-day -day basis. So what can we do to couple those things together? And, and bear in mind, as um, Elizabeth Marinko I said in her talk yesterday, and you may have heard in, other, in some other places, Wikipedia is a substantial and major driver of traffic to the research literature. It is the eighth largest source of traffic through the Crossref DOI resolver. It is the sixth highest source of traffic to PLOS One, um, as an example, uh, I looked yesterday. Um, so it's an important source of traffic, an important source of a particular kind of traffic to the, to the research literature. Um, so when thinking about this talk, uh, w one way I like to think characterizing it is the existing process is, is an inside out process. People with inside the walls of these journals decide what they're going to bless and they push that out into the world. And, and, and that will also so often be channeled out through um, press releases and drive the news stories of the day. But in a world where we have open scholarship and we, where we have open communities, 
we're looking at much more of an outside-in process where the world which sees things of interest generates this kind of front matter content and helps contextualize it and bring people who are interested in those topics to the primary literature. And uh, you know, we, we currently have a couple of projects going on in Wikipedia which are helping with this. There's uh, the Wikipedia Open Project. Um, Daniel's in incredibly involved in this kind of thing. Um, however, my sense is that, in particular, publishers, publishers so far have not participated in thinking about this up until this point. And I think the roots for making these connections have happened organically, which is good. But the question we'd like to talk about today is, are there any specific actions that we can take to help with this kind of process? And I have this vision that every piece of research of, con of consequence should have its root into it from Wikipedia. There should be ways in which it is easy for people to curate the equivalent of um, uh, uh, um, review articles in Wikipedia which point as nodes out to all of the primary research of importance and which can talk about the debates of importance that are happening in research that have an effect on the general public. So what are the barriers to making that happen and what can we do today to accelerate moving towards that kind of vision? So so we started to you know, think about this as, as this, this cycle, this, this hopefully this virtuous cycle of information that can flow both from the research literature into Wikipedia, and again, Daniel's work on multimedia imports is a great example of that, and Daniel regularly hassles me and others about what we're not doing to make that easier enough. Um, so there's those kinds of questions. How can we make it easier for research content um, to flow into Wikipedia? Um, but I think in particular, this question of what can we do to make it easier for people to, to travel from Wikipedia into the research literature, if that's what they want to do. Um, so we have a range of blocks. Um, the, uh, the ones at the top um, are maybe significantly techno technological, and then the ones at the bottom, um, in this case, are more about trying to understand who is coming, who, who's flowing down this path and what are the paths. But with that, really, we'd like to you know, open it up to you guys and see what do you think are the blocks as a starting point and, and what can we start to do about them um, in the context, particularly in the context of this community? Does anyone want to kick that off? Daniel! <laughs> Actually, I don't want to kick it off. I would like the others to, uh, to start it. But I have a long list. <laughs> <laughs> so, for starters, something that is not often talked about is images. Uh, like on uh, Wikimedia platforms, we have long switched from uh, being, well, basically bitmaps to uh, SVG, editable graphics format, for things that are not, that have not been photographed, like uh, any nice uh, infographics or things like that. And, uh, well, almost all something in jails, they uh, publish regularly such infographs that could be really useful in a media context. And especially since, for instance, any um, annotations of the pieces in the graph are typically in English because the research literature is in English, but our platforms are in multiple languages. And so if you want to use the same uh, piece of information in another language, we will have to re-engineer this program. So this is really annoying. I'll, I'll yeah, so, so image, image formats and, and flattening them into bitmaps in particular, I think, is, is one that we hear Why quite well. Why do you need uh, other languages? I mean, English is the scientific language, so let's face it. Well, I think... Oh, so, uh, I think uh, Wikipedia so, has multiple languages. That's so, so yeah. So the question was oh, what, on, the, qu the question was why do we need other why, why do we need other languages outside of English? And uh, I think um, one th so one thing we've been thinking about inside of eLife is whether we could provide Chinese language uh, and Japanese language short summaries to our content because year on year the largest growth in output in research is coming from China. Chinese authors take, on average, 200 hours to write their papers, in contrast to 60 hours for non-Chinese authors. And so giving them quicker entry points so they can orient themselves in the literature and then work in English to get their outputs can help them overcome that language barrier. And so there are significant and well-understood reasons for wanting to be able to make the literature accessible across those language barriers. And I think the other point I would make is there's, there's this, this, um, this 
question, document question mark thing in the middle is, is really just a, a signal to say, you know, do we need intermediate steps from an encyclopedia through some form of um, what we in the publishing industry would probably call lay summaries on the route through, or, or is it better to just let people go straight to that space? And that's a question that I, I don't know the answer to, but it's probably different for different people with, with different needs. But Francis, you have hand up. Yeah, so the, so, the, so the point was why why did I describe the top the top as technical? What I meant was the things I've written there are, um, are technical, um, to be fair. And I guess I was thinking that the incentives arise, the incentives for publishers start to arise when we collectively realise that there's a lot of potential traffic and audience and consumers and potentially product customers if we create this virtual cycle and to get and it's the classic chicken and the egg. We don't get there until we solve the technical problems, but we don't solve the technical problems until the social problems have been solved. I have one question here and I, 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 I just I just like to make one comment on that as well, which is um so far the these bridges have entirely been driven by efforts coming from the Wikipedia community. And so I almost feel a bit of bold faced cheek sitting up here as a publisher talking about this vision. And I think that we as publishers have a long way to go. We've got to bring a lot more to the table than we have in the past. Yeah, and actually thinking about thinking about the way I, I wrote these things down. Yeah, the top half was stuff I think we need to do as publishers, and the bottom stuff is stuff that I think we need to get in place to show to publishers that they need to do it. So there's a query over here. is um, there have been some interesting experiments to try and help automate that process. So in particular, there's one called the Wikipod Project Computational Biology, where artifacts were created in within a, within a scholarly space, but automatically shipped over as stubs into the Wikipedia community to try and help hope that the Wikipedia community would flesh those out. And this had moderate success. Yeah, it's probably worth saying to, to also in the, um echo Ian's point about bald faced cheek, it's in the end to echo your point about it being about the person, the people. I think pretty much every project we've mentioned so far that comes from the Wikipedia side is actually Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> so we should we should we should we should ignore that and, and talk about how we, we expand on that. Um, which is a good point to throw to Jeff perhaps as to how we might as an industry start um, supporting some of those things. So when I first joined Thank you. 
tools to evangelize about it in order to increase that. I do think that there might be, you know, when we talk to our public, to our members, and let them know about that number, eight, it shocked a lot of them. It really sort of woke them up. And I had people come to me after you know, the board meeting and say, wow, we had no idea. And this is true. I used to do consulting for publishers. I had publishers who would ask us to filter out web traffic that hit their site that wasn't from university ID ranges because that was normal. Right? So there is a really, I mean, there has been an entrenched, bizarre attitude towards traffic that comes out from um, but, but this has gotten their notice. I think it would be an interesting thing to do another study to try and estimate the number of references in Wikipedia that A, are probably pointing to scholarly literature, and B, that are actually linked to it, and then C, that are linked to it using identifiers. That would give us an idea of really what the, of the potential. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'm not sure if this, this is a relevant question, but the editor who created the article about that monkey, did you have a look to see how many like, thousands of articles have been written on, on the monkeys? Because I bet it's, and I found this in lots of different areas, there's a very, very small number of writers who create the vast majority of articles. There's so much over the last few days I've met so many technical people, but the actual writers, it's, it's such a small number, I think, if you have to target those people to like refine the process. Yeah, and I think that's that, that question of how we can collectively leverage those communities and help to grow them. I mean, I think the comment that um, was made in the opening um, session around you know, growing pains, yeah. um, that you know, the core, when the core of the community, the core of the value creation is content writing. And I, you know, again, I don't, I don't think we as publishers do enough to support support that. And I think, again, the, the creating this virtual cycle where we show this is important, we'll start to, to mean that we support that a lot more effectively. Um, what about incentive for researchers themselves to be writing about their articles in Wikipedia? It's such a massive driver of traffic. Surely you can convince researchers to write about their articles in Wikipedia and make yourself more discoverable, it'll make more people come and see your journal article, even if it's not necessarily other scientists, it's still going to get the research out there. But I think in the research community, there's still a perception that Wikipedia is perhaps less prestigious and so much points in writing about it, so maybe you can change that perception. So I'm a recovering academic, um, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it's it, it's a really it's a it's a really important point. There's actually a quote that um, from me, and I think it's either Wikimedia UK or the Wikim Wikimedia Foundation annual report from a couple of years back. And basically, it was along the lines of, if you're a researcher and you're worried about going out to schools and giving talks, and that's what you think engagement is, you're wasting your time. You, you yes, you've reached fifteen children and that's a good thing and there's nothing nothing wrong with doing that um, and we should encourage that but if you're actually short of time you can reach millions of people by putting improving an article in Wikipedia in much less time and I think that when I was I, I did exactly that that was I was I had this mandate to do engagement work um, from the funders that were funding my research and my response was oh well, well I need to find a local school to go out and give a talk at and it never really occurred to me that that would be a smart thing to do. So I think we need to we need to tell that story that this is one of the most effective forms of engagement, wider engagement that a researcher can can undertake. Daniel has um, hand up. I'll, 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 if I may, I have one comment as well, which is um, Plus A and M apps uh, starts now to track uh, references coming in from Wikipedia to scholarly articles, but there's still a gap. There's still I mean, as publishers. We still haven't really done that good job on whole on letting authors know when that event happens. But we're in a position today where we can know when those events happen. And I think the next step that we have to take on is having that conversation with our authors and saying, look, look, there is interest from this this area. So previously the publishers decide what's going to be front what isn't. So we can take this into your hands. Yeah. Isn't that self-promotion then? Isn't writing an article self-promotion in a way? So, uh, so I, I agree if, if the author is making those references, but, we, but I think I would see it as just a way of raising awareness that those references are being made. And I wouldn't necessarily say to the author, I would now like you to go and make more of them, but just starting that as a conversation of raising awareness that that's an interesting and valuable location where 
commentary is coming in to their, to their article. So it's, uh, it is, I think it's a really important point, and we know, we know from other metrics that we have in the research space that if you put a metric in place, then people will start to perform against it, um, and in a very instrumental way. So I think, and, and, and worse than that, we don't, as a research community, I would, I would say I, we don't have the kind, same kind of ethical framework that Wikipedia does have, and we prop, even if the people recognised it was there, there probably isn't sufficient respect for that ethical framework and the differences between that ethical framework and, 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 and the ones we have in research. So there's something we need to be very careful of. Um, and I think it's I think it is a really really important point. So at one hand, somewhere here, oh no, I did say Daniel was next, didn't I? <laughs> Let's start with the question about who started the Lesola article. I just looked that up. So that is a person normally working on improving references on uh, Wikipedia, actually. So he wrote actually a tool that helps with that. And uh, he has, uh, over the last uh, five years, contributed 500 edits, which is not a lot by Wikipedia standards. So it's not, he's not one of those that he worked with. Yeah, right. And only one of these seems to be another monkey or uh, tape. So he's not one of the specialists. And, I think this is a typical pattern. Many people actually come in via things that are mentioned in the news, in the classical news, or yeah. in, in blogs or so. And then they check, well, what does Wikipedia say about it? And if it's a species that has been newly described, Wikipedia may not say anything about it, or uh, the article has just been cited. And that's how people come in. Yeah, and that's uh, the curiosity about it. If people sort of target that, because there's so many articles I've written just because, you know, let's say there's like a suicide bomb or someone famous being assassinated, or let's say there's some incredible like historical things you can and you know I I would probably have to put on the front page if you put it in like the Digimo section then you have to find something relatively obscure going straight to the thing and So is this then creating a paradox where we're saying that the only way to incentivize people to create the front matter is by pre baking their idea <laughs> that it might be interesting by putting it into front matter elsewhere. Yeah, Most of the crap is being published. It's um, 
one thing we didn't say earlier on, I think it's an important point, is that the publisher, resp the publisher response to the, to the idea that we need clearer summaries of research work is, always, is, is the immediate thing to say, well, we'll get the researchers to write a, a, a lay summary, because we don't need to pay anyone to do it, and obviously they're the experts. And some people, a very small proportion of researchers, can write really excellent lay summaries, and most can't. We, um, we, 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 write, we write a lay write, summary for it. every single research article and we started with the idea that the researchers would do it and we've abandoned that and we, we get their sign off on the summaries that we write for them, it's called a e life digest, but they were incapable of writing that themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's just too expensive to do that for everything, that's, for everything. The, that's well, how, can we, how can we bridge that gap? So one last, one last comment before yes. I have to close. I would like to come back to what the said. I mean, consider there are those who play in the major league uh, and uh, those are possibly very difficult to get because they would like to get their publication under physicists and physical review or physical review letters and so on and so on and they wouldn't care about Wikipedia. Uh, but then there are those playing the minor league trying to get into the major league and they are possibly very interested to spread what they have done uh, into all all sorts, into all the channels. So aren't you afraid that you may get at the uh, end uh, rather those who play in the major, in the minor league than the major league? Um, knowing what is good ahead of time is very difficult. So uh, one of my contentions with the front matter as we have it construed today is that it in no way correlates with the quality of the research. and. So I, don't, I, I think the only worry I have on that topic is I'll worry about that in about 100 years when I look back and see if we made any mistakes. But I'm not going to worry about it before then. I think at the end of the day, the quality, quality is a misused and badly used word. Um, research has qualities and its, its most important quality is that of use at some level for some things. Well, that's further research, further it's education, whether it's interest and engagement um, and it is incumbent on all of those of us who receive public funding in particular but, but do research to configure the way we communicate in the way to maximise its use um, and the bottom line, I wrote, about, I wrote a blog post about this yesterday so you can, I'm just borrowing words from, from myself now but the um, Wikipedia is one of the primary information flows of the 21st century. There is, there is no two ways about it. It is the third, second, whatever it was, most trafficked site on the web. Um, fifth, sorry. Um, and that's behind you know, a couple of search engines and wicked things like that. It is the primary way that people come to information. And we, as researchers, who need to continue to make the case for public funding, um, ignore that at our peril. So just to, just to finish off, I, I wanted to finish by, by reading two quotes and then move on to the panel session. So, so many of you will have seen this quote um, from the great philosopher. Um, and it's one that we often use when we talk about research and the web and the internet and, and, and indeed Wikipedia. Um, but this is a very insular version of how researchers could use the web, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a vision built on, this is for, was built for us, we should use it. Um, I think there's a different vision, and this was a quote, Martin Poulter pointed this out to me last night, um, that comes from Tim Berners-Lee. And he's really talking about what an encyclopedia is in its, in its original sense, the notion of it being the source of, of information where experts and interested people can come together to create, update and curate knowledge. But I think it's that bottom line that I think is, 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 is critical. The importance of a paper is in some way conveyed by the number of links is away from an encyclopedia. Um, and Tim saw that you know, getting on for 15 years ago, um, it's about time we started to get there. So with that, thank you very much. Um, I'll just say, if you would like to continue this discussion, we'll have a London Open Drinks event next Tuesday in a bar not far from here. So check it out, londonopendrinks.org. Hey. Yeah. Thanks.
Okay, so uh, thank you Cameron and Ian. And now let's welcome a panel on open access and Wikipedia, moderated by Melissa Hagen. This is going to be an overview of uh, open access developments globally, as well as um, the importance that open access can play within the Wikimedia movement. Um, now, Stuart already introduced uh, myself, but I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we're, of course, very um, privileged to have Jimmy Wales joining us, who doesn't need any introduction. Uh, um, and we're also joined by Alma Swan, who's the executive director of Spark Europe and really a leading force um, in the um, uh, advocacy of open access both in the UK and Europe. Nick Shockey is director of um, the Right to Research Project in leading um, work with students on open access internationally. Jonathan Gray is with the Open Knowledge um, and is leading a project here in the UK um, to support open access to the humanities and social sciences. And Daniel, of course, doesn't need much of an introduction either to, to this crowd, but has really been the driving force um, to advocate for open access within the Wikimedia community for many years now. And much of the work that um, we've seen in advancing um, collaboration between the open access and Wikimedia communities is thanks to Daniel. So with that, um, we'll first start with Jimmy, as I think that many people, when we first proposed this session, wondered why Jimmy would be joining a panel on open access. Yet, I think he's been following the open access movement for probably longer than many have been aware of it. And we might have that um, thanks to a very long taxi ride in Brazil <laughs> um, when um, we had a captive audience. But um, to help frame our session, Jimmy, I think it'd be helpful if you could share why you think open access is important and how it can really contribute to the Wikimedia Foundation's mission. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, well, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about four uh, four areas of where why I think open access is important, uh, and I will start with uh, with Wikipedia. Um, this is actually fairly obvious and straightforward. Uh, Wikipedia is the for first port of call for uh, 500 plus million people every month. Um, throughout the course of a year probably a billion people come to Wikipedia um, seeking uh, knowledge, seeking information. And so it's really important that this community uh, of Wikipedians um, and, and all the ones who can't make it to Wikimania have access to high quality uh, information so that they can update the entries accordingly. And uh, because the Wikipedia editing community is dispersed and amateur, only some portion of the community would have access to proprietary academic journals. In fact, probably a very small portion of the community, I would estimate 5, 10, 15 percent have some kind of access. Most of the rest have moved on from university, they're out in careers, um, or they're um, too young, or they never went to university, or who knows where they live, and so forth. And so the more academic research is available to this community, the more they will be able to improve the encyclopedia. Um, instead of relying on, you know, more distant uh, sources. 
So that's the first reason, and the direct reason that actually, uh, you know, was my initial interest in uh, open access. Uh, then, of course, there's the research community generally, and I'm talking here about the uh, just the, the mainstream research community, um, where you know even when they do have access through expensive journal subscriptions and things like that, um, there's all the possibilities of reuse. There's all the possibilities of building on each other's work in innovative ways that is more than just, um, oh, I'm gonna read this paper. It's I'm gonna actually take this paper, I'm gonna take the diagrams from it, I'm gonna take the data set, I'm gonna redo some new things, I'm gonna data mine the body of research. There's all that kind of interesting work that can happen much more easily if the licensing is right and everything is, is um, allowed uh, to be done. The next uh, group or area I'm uh, very keenly interested in is in the developing world. Um, one of my favorite uh, slides that I use sometimes, which I may have stolen from Melissa, I'm not sure where I got it originally, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a, a journal article uh, called uh, something like um, uh, On the Problems of Access to Knowledge in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so it's an, it's an analysis of the problem of access to knowledge in Sub-Saharan Africa and you see the web page, and then you scroll down, and you see to, to read the paper costs thirty-five dollars. Uh, so the paper itself is in you know is on the web in such a form as to illustrate the problem of uh, access to knowledge. So we know that um, you know uh, academics, professors, scientists, researchers in uh, the developing world, their universities cannot afford um, access to expensive journal subscriptions, um, and you know, they end up begging colleagues to send them copies of papers and so forth because they just don't have it, um, their library can't afford it. Um, and so that's a huge drain on the world's um, uh, research community resources, but it's a particular drain on people, uh, on in, in topics that are of keen interest to people in the developing world. Um, it's not just that, well, we're deprived of their knowledge, but they're deprived of researching and advancing areas that are of keen importance um, in their world, and these are some of the poorest places in the world often, and they need everything, every tool they can get. Um, and then finally, there's, there's everyone. Um, and so the, here I'm thinking of uh, the, the, the Jack Andrekas of the world. So this is the young man who uh, invented a new test for pancreatic cancer. He'll be speaking later today. I'm so excited to meet him. Um, and he, uh, he had a relative who, who died of pancreatic cancer, and he got really interested in the topic and started researching it. He says he, he started learning about it on Wikipedia, um, dug deeper, uh, started reading open access scientific research, and ultimately came up with, a, with an invention. That's incredible, right? And, and you could have never predicted that particular young man doing that, and no one would have bought him journal subscriptions, and he didn't have normal access. And there's the in incredible intellectual capacity of the planet. And the more that people have access to good quality uh, scientific research, and well, not just scientific humanities, all kinds of things, uh, then um, we don't know what will happen, but it's, it's gonna be you know, a flourishing, uh, a renaissance, uh, the, the more that we can have that. And of course, as we all know, in the world of um, uh, Buzzfeed and Destructify and um, nonsense, uh, uh, there is on the web this whole world of intellectual activity um, and supporting and extending that is really important and very powerful and open access is one of the best ways to do that. Thank you. I like to bring you out for every um, panel session I do on <laughs> open access in the future. Um, uh, now, Alma Swan, as I mentioned, has been um, a real driving force in the advancement of open access here in the UK. And since Wikimania is here, we wanted um, to invite Alma to share with us some um, of the progress which has been made um, in terms of promoting open access in the UK, but also in Europe as a whole, because much of the policy which is developed here in the UK is influenced by um, work which is being done in the EU or is trying to influence, influence work that's being done in the EU. <clears throat> I just want to go back to something Jimmy just said about the developing world, because I think the statistic is that for medical institutes in the developing world, the average number of journals that they can afford to purchase is between four and ten. And I think since they shoulder 90% of the world's health problems, that rather puts things into perspective. Um, yes, it's a pleasure to tell you about what's been going on in Europe. Um, our work 
the advocacy community for open access is focused really on in four main areas. First of all, policy. And we've been working on European level policy, which we now have in place thanks to the European Commission's new policy for the Horizon 2020 Research Framework Programme. At national level, and there are 28 members of the European Union plus more countries in Europe, so this is a big kind of collaborative effort across the continent trying to um, enhance uh, policies that are already there and uh, trying to get policies in place where they're not already there at national level. Um, and also there's been a lot of work done at institutional level, so the level of individual universities and research institutes to try to get a complete consistent policy uh, picture. Now this is a long way off getting that complete but, but it's on the way now and it's going to be helped by this new European level policy. And there are two projects now which are funded at EU level working to support that policy to help to promote it, to help to um, push it across the nations of Europe that don't yet have policies and to train people in what open access is all about. So, <clears throat> where there already is a policy, we work to try to get improvements because none of them are perfect. And this is, uh, the way of doing this is just to keep trying to get incremental changes in the policy. And each time we do that, hopefully it gets better. Authors are another big area. Um, I don't know what to say about them. I've been, <laughs> I've been doing this for a very long time now. And we have had some very major successes. And I do think open access is now part of the common parlance of authors. But it's still, there's still a big job out there to raise awareness. And when we've done that, to make sure that they understand what open access is all about. Because it's very easy to get things uh, slightly wrong. And there are a lot of misconceptions that tend to turn authors away from it. And then to get them to realise the importance of it and then to change their behaviour, to accept it and to start providing open access for themselves. Now policies help with that, but they do, don't do the whole thing. And advocacy within the author community is very important. Technology is another area where there's been a lot of work going on. I'm not going to say too much about that because Daniel's got much more to say than me. But the technology is being put in place bit by bit by bit by bit to help support policies, to help authors comply with policies and to measure that compliance. And all those things are very important. Along with that, we have a major piece of infrastructure in Europe called Open Air, funded by the European Commission to provide open access to be the home of the papers that come out from research funded by the Commission. And that's a very significant piece of infrastructure and probably likely to be emulated in other parts of the world. And then finally, just to touch briefly, an area on permissions. And Jimmy mentioned this, the fact that we want the scholarly literature to be available for reuse as well as reading. And reading is very important, but being able to reuse it in research is critical these days. It's the way much research is going. And so um, a lot of work on are trying to get good laws on amending copyright. We've got a great one now in the UK, and um, there's a lot of work going on now in Brussels, talking to the Commission about what can be done there. The key issue for governments, and we want them to make policy, the key issue is innovation. That's what they're interested in, making innovation a possibility, or giving innovators a better chance of doing their work well. And open access, of course, provides a lot of material on which innovators can work. <coughs> we know from a study of small businesses in Denmark that innovate, that they have trouble getting hold of the literature, but that when they can get it, it helps them develop new products and services. If there's a delay in getting that, then that's a problem to them and costs a lot of money. In making that argument to governments, which they will listen to, we need evidence and we need examples of success and we're constantly on the hunt for those and I believe there are people in this audience here today who will have some. If you do, we would like to hear them, please. Success stories. 
Um, and then there's the big issue of sustainability. Now this is looking forward and this is really the, my last point here. But what we're trying to think about now is how to work on the advances we've made for open access and look at how to put together a system that is going to be sustainable for the long term. That doesn't just mean how much is it going to cost in terms of publication. That's a big argument and a big area of discussion, but we're not just thinking about that. We're thinking about all the infrastructures that support the scholarly communication system. There's many services currently supporting open access and helping it to grow. And most of them are running on project funding or goodwill. You all know about that. It's not a way to go on into the longer term with something so important as the scholarly communication system. Now, there are some initiatives coming out to, to um, promote debate and discussion on this, primarily from the US and Europe. And these are getting the attention, I think, of, of people who can help with this, but there's a lot more work to do there. Um, we have open air, as I mentioned, I just want to pick that out again as an infrastructure that is important, and yet it is still running. I think this is the third three-year funding that it's getting from the European Commission. It's likely to get more, I guess, after this, but every time the three years comes up, there has to be another project proposal and open air, the open air people have to make it. That's worked so far, but it's very, very flaky, I think, for the long term. We want a commitment from the European Commission that they will fund that piece of infrastructure forever, until it's not needed anymore, at least. And similarly with other pieces of infrastructure. So there's some work going on on that. Um, there is, um, an organisation that I and a couple of other people have set up, which is a community interest company, i.e. Uh, um, not, it's not owned by anybody, and it's run in the interest of the community. It's a not-for-profit thing, and it will start to build an umbrella to shelter some of these services that support open access. That's it, Melissa, for the EU. Thank you, Alma. Um, and we're moving on to Nick, who will share some developments coming out of the U.S., but also specifically touch on the work he's been doing with students, which is a community that for many years the open access community had not done a proper job in terms of reaching out to for really we need to educate students about open access because they are the future of our research community. Thanks, Melissa. It's been my mm -hmm. absolute pleasure to work with students on open access for the last five years and to sort of build on the first points that Alma made and that uh, Jimmy made as well uh, about the developing world, um, you know, not having sufficient access to the journal uh, literature. Uh, the students that we work with all over the developing world have an incredible thirst uh, for these journal articles, uh, just incredible. And oftentimes they'll actually spend their own money uh, to buy articles that they need because they want uh, to have research careers and be researchers and to do that they have, um, you know, to, to publish paper, papers, publish, uh, you know, theses. Um, so they'll actually buy these articles with um, you know, the, the funds that they have, and it's an incredible burden. Uh, but the passion that they have for open access is incredible. Uh, we've been working with students in uh, developing countries for a number of years now. Uh, just as an example, in 2012, uh, the Medical Students Association of Kenya educated nearly half of all Kenyan medical students in one week during International Open Access Week about open access and why it's important. They also engaged university administrators uh, and faculty and actually contributed to passing an institutional open access policy uh, at the University of Nairobi. And actually just within the last year, there have been national level open access campaigns launched in Nigeria, in, Ni in Nepal, uh, and in Tanzania. And the ones in Nigeria and Nepal have established chapters uh, in less than one year at every medical university in those countries. Um, and are you know, having conversations with administrators, they're having conversations with ministers of education, uh, and really having an impact uh, so I think it's important to highlight the incredible work that's actually being done around open access advocacy in uh, the developing world. Uh, but that's only a small part of what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I guess what I mainly want to focus on is the uh, really remarkable progress on open access that's happened um, within the United States over the last couple of years. Uh, sort of the biggest step forward we've had came in February of last year uh, when the White House uh, issued an executive directive uh, essentially requiring that all the results of publicly funded research in the U.S. Uh, be made publicly available within 12 months of publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and didn't do exactly that. It essentially uh, directed the agencies that make uh, these grants 
to develop plans uh, you know, to, to achieve that goal. Uh, you know, this is a significant step forward. The U.S. Uh, as a whole spends more than $60 billion per year uh, on research funding that generates, you know, uh, 100,000 plus uh, academic research papers. Um, so it's, you know, a huge amount of research literature that will be uh, unlocked. And I think uh, sort of as a win, uh, it's incredibly important. I was here last night um, watching the Internet's own boy, the, uh, the documentary about Aaron Swartz's life. And this sort of uh, win reminded me of the quote that his, uh, I guess one of his uh, friends that worked in Congress said that about the SOPA and PIPA debate, that these, these type of wins like SOPA and PIPA don't happen uh, when all the money is on one side and just millions of people are on the other. Um, and I think this uh, White House executive directive is very much in the same vein because you know, there were uh, opponents to open access that spent millions of dollars um, lobbying against these efforts. Um, you know, but it was the efforts of the research community of librarians, of students, um, you know, that signed uh, a We the People petition uh, that got, uh, in the end, I think over 40,000 signatures. They really forced, um, you know, the White House to take notice of the issue and then take meaningful action. And so I think open access is another issue, um, you know, where we've seen incredible progress led by the community, even when there are moneyed interests uh, on, on the other side. Um, we've seen other types of progress um, within the last year. Um, the U.S. finally passed an appropriations bill um, for the first time in some time earlier this year, and I'm happy to report that that actually included uh, language that requires three agencies uh, to make their uh, research uh, freely available online. And that, in some senses, is somewhat redundant to White House directive, but legislative language in the U.S. is much more durable. Uh, the next administration could come in and reverse uh, the currently existing White House directive, and so this legislative language is important in making these open access policies uh, permanent. We've also seen the national level efforts spill over to the states in the U.S. as well. We've seen state level uh, open access legislation in New York and Illinois and in California. And I'm having a report in California last year uh, when the legislation was first introduced, it uh, passed through the California State Assembly by an overwhelming uh, majority. Uh, unfortunately, didn't make it out of committee that session. It was granted reconsideration this year where it actually just this week uh, passed out of the California Senate <coughs> Appropriations Committee. Um, so there's great effort um, and progress at the state levels where well, but just because there's progress doesn't mean sort of the battle is won. I think there's a lot that the community still needs to be doing to make sure that we actually see uh, sort of the full benefits of these policies that have been passed and defend them, um, you know, against those that wish to weaken them. Uh, I think one particularly salient example is that the first plan from a U.S. federal agency uh, responding to the White House directive was actually just released by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, you know, and while it will, uh, in some form, make the articles resulting from the grants uh, that they give freely available online, it makes two very significant concessions uh, in our view. The first is that it uh, allows publishers to retain full control uh, of the articles rather than making them available in uh, a publicly uh, sort of funded database like the U.S. NIH PubMed Central, which it feels really important to make sure that there's durable and ongoing access to these articles that the government uh, controls. And also the, the other big issue is that it doesn't have anything to say about reuse rights. Uh, it doesn't you know, make sure that these articles are made uh, available uh, under licenses that allow for uh, their reuse, which we think uh, is, is particularly important. And I think something that the Wikimedia and Wikipedia community can play a significant role in sort of highlighting the, the importance of that. Um, you know, I think uh, sort of the Wikipedia community lives and breathes the importance of reuse rights. It's what allows Wikipedia to be Wikipedia, right? Um, you know, when you have an image or a video on Wikipedia, it doesn't link out to somebody else's website. It's hosted by Wikipedia. How great would it be if the scholarly articles that are referenced in Wikipedia could stay within Wikipedia, right? If you could go to Wikicommons and actually read the full text of these articles that are cited in all of the Wikipedia pages. What if, um, you know, through Wikipedia Zero in some countries, you can not only read the Wikipedia article, but you can click on the reference and read the full text of the scholarly article that it's referencing. Um, so I think you know these types of things would be great for the Wikipedia community to think about, and then talk to policymakers about talk about why reuse is sort of the secret sauce of Wikipedia, and how it's also in many ways the sort of secret sauce of science as well in making this sharing frictionless. Um, and then also just on sort of a more day-to-day -day basis, talking to colleagues and friends and just the wider community about reuse rights and why it's important. Try to expose people um, and educate them about that. Um, and then also, you know, access is still uh, a huge, huge problem. I mean, it's something that people face uh, every day, so there's still uh, a lot of, of progress to be made, even in wealthy countries. People still have, um, you know, tremendous challenges getting access to the research literature. Uh, I've got to ask, how many of you have either asked for somebody to share a paper with you online or shared a paper with somebody online? 
So I think that sort of tells you what you need to know. But, uh, you know, I guess one thing you might not be aware of is actually there's a PhD candidate in Colombia named uh, Diego uh, Gomez, who's actually facing eight years in prison for doing exactly what you all have done, uh, for posting uh, actually a master's thesis online. Um, he's facing eight years and criminal, him, uh, criminal prosecution um, for having done that. And this just shouldn't happen if open access um, you know, was the norm and these papers were available. You wouldn't have to go sort of around copyright um, in order to share this incredibly valuable information with colleagues um, that need access to it. Um, so with that, I just want to close by saying that this sort of passion from the student community that I've been privileged to see has been incredible. Um, you know, the work that I mentioned in Nepal, Nigeria, uh, in Kenya, um, in Tanzania, and elsewhere has just been uh, really incredible. Some of the, the best examples we have of student engagement come from those places. Uh, and the Right to Research Coalition has grown from a petition with six organizations in 2009 uh, to now sort of a fully grown coalition of nearly 80 student organizations that represent about 7 million students in a little bit over 100 countries. And the, the projects that come out of uh, these student organizations are incredible. Uh, and I think one I just want to highlight in closing is uh, one called the Open Access Button that we have a few representatives from uh, here in the room, which is an effort to not only chart uh, every sort of collision with the paywall that people have, but also help to connect people with freely accessible copies of articles and even send people, uh, authors of articles emails when people run into paywalls trying to get access to their articles. Um, you can read more about it at uh, openaccessbutton.org. Um, it's just an incredible project. Uh, and then lastly, we're hosting a, a conference later this year called OpenCon uh, 2014 in Washington, DC, which is an effort to support and catalyze student and early career re researcher-led uh, projects and initiatives related to open access, open education, and uh, uh, open data. And so if you are a student and early career researcher, I'd really encourage you to check it out and apply to attend. We're giving travel scholarships to a lar large proportion of uh, the participants, and so we'd love uh, to have you there as well. Thank you, Nick. Now, while we're seeing open access advancements um, really in the uh, STM fields, where um, we haven't really done enough is in the humanities and, and, and social sciences. And so Jonathan is going to share a bit of the opportunities and challenges which we're still facing in these fields and some work which um, Open Knowledge is going to be doing um, to help um, advance open access here. Yeah, um, so as we've heard, it's generally been a very good decade for open access um, you know, since uh, um, I remember when I first started working in this field, it was a very sort of different situation and um, the level of um, high level political support in many countries around the world has grown immensely as we've heard um, and uh, we do see an increasing number of policies which are requiring uh, open access um, uh, which is excellent. Um, however, I, I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how uh, top-down policies um, and mandates are an essential sort of advocacy target but at the same time um, stepping back they're not enough um, and the task that we have in front of us is uh, you know, just to step back the large-scale recomposition of the scholarly communication system um, we're looking at sort of change from end to end and I think um, part, partly what I wanted to talk about is uh, looking at open access not just as a single issue but within the broader uh, context of um, the scholarly communication system and higher education um, and how that kind of broader context is playing out in relation to uh, humanities and social science researchers um, objections to, to, to open access. Um, so I think ultimately what we're keen to see is um, in addition to these top-down policies we need leadership and active support from researchers um, who are working in many of these fields. Um, as we said, there's, there's really incredible progress being made in STEM. I think also the arguments are often clearer. Um, you have extrinsic arguments to do with um, you know, whether it's development or medicine or science, the progress of science. Um, in humanities and social sciences, uh, the extrinsic case is not so clear uh, in, in many cases. I mean, it obviously depends on the subject. Um, and still, that's where we're seeing um, the majority of opposition and uh, support. Notably, I guess, in, in the UK, um, it, it's, it's really been striking how um, uh, the humanities and social sciences have been 
vocally, most vocally opposed to, to sort of current um, policy. So I guess the first thing I want to look at briefly is why, um, and to take this seriously rather than just assume you know we're right, they just don't understand. Um, there's there's got to be something in it. Um, you know, uh, on one level, you know, to me, I'm I'm also a researcher. Um, in addition to the sort of policy work I do, uh, one level, open access seems obvious. Who who would be opposed to greater, um, more easy access to to research, which is the stuff that you, you know, it's the, the lifeblood of what you're doing, it's lifeblood of scholarship. Um, on the one hand, there is, I guess, in the social sciences, a lack of general awareness. Still, I'm amazed speaking to sort of senior colleagues how they just don't really understand. You know, maybe something to the internet technology don't really understand what it is. Um, I would also add that actually one of the things which is slowing down um, uh, the recognition of the problem is the fact that um, piracy is endemic in um, uh, amongst sort of early career stage researchers and uh, researchers in the humanities and social sciences. People go onto websites where they download books illegally, um, not realising <laughs> that actually that's not probably the way that this scholarly communication system should function. Um, nor is that a sustainable um, way for the um, system to work. Uh, I think there is widespread misunderstanding, there is lobbying, um, there are concerns about sustainability, um, but I think it's important to, in addition to all those things, look at, you know, there are issues with career structures, um, there are issues with the way in which reputation and trust accrue around different publication venues, and people often mistake the cart for the horse and think that, you know, because the, uh, the reputation of the journal um, is, is going to be the thing which gets them sort of tenure or sort of a lasting job. And they mistake the, the, the value of that journal um, as being the thing which is important rather than the scholarly community around that, which is actually the thing which is giving that publication value. Um, but also, I guess, stepping back, um, particularly in the UK, I'd argue that we need to look at um, some of these things within the broader context of um, changes in higher education, um, changes in funding. Um, I think a lot of people feel um, under attack about the pressure to, um, you know, commercialise and you know, just talking to academics. They're kind of worried that there's kind of like they, they, I think there's a lot a, a growing sense of things being imposed on them from outside. Um, so, I guess. My contention would be our task as um, people who are in, uh, in many ways um, leading um, open access uh, and at the forefront uh, of the sort of open access movement, um, we need to listen to many of these concerns and take them seriously um, and look at the bigger picture and appreciate the challenges and concerns that people have. Um, and there is a kind of basically big task still of um, sort of fairly old-fashioned community organising within uh, scholarly communities to identify leaders, to um, take this on as something that needs to be uh, you know, approached institution by institution, field by field, um, to take on this grand task of recomposition, um, replacing or kind of finding alternatives to uh, existing sort of closed access publications, um, making self-archiving ubiquitous, um, and um, encouraging early career stage researchers to set up new open access venues, uh, and all kinds of other things. I think um, just as important as the day-to-day -day practice is um, doing a better job of communicating um, to more different audiences the big picture of why this matters, and ultimately why we think that uh, open access should be a fundamental quality of the scholarly communication system that we want in the future. Um, not just something which is sort of imposed from the outside, but something which is very obviously uh, a desirable property of scholarship. Um, and I think uh, part of the work that we're planning to do is to continue to develop a strong, bold, um, public uh, interest vision around um, uh, what sort of, uh, the scholarly communication would look like in humanities and social sciences. Uh, and so we're looking at, um, right now at uh, what we can do to secure uh, support from high-level um, academics, like uh, public intellectuals, 
um, in humanities and social sciences in the UK um, to systematically address some of the recurring concerns that we see um, and it's amazing um, we were at a conference last year and uh, some of the misunderstandings are incredible like uh, about plagiarism and um, attribution and the implications of uh, open access um, ultimately we want to build uh, bottom-up momentum for open access uh, in humanities and social sciences o and open up people's imagination about what the system should look like in the future rather than just being quite conservatively looking at um, the way things work at the moment and being nervous about um, changes. Um, I guess I'll close there, but if you are interested in uh, open access information and social science, please do come and talk to me uh, about um, what you're working on. I'd love to hear about it and see what we can do uh, as we're building this work in the coming months. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and Daniel, as you mentioned earlier, has been doing much work um, between the two communities and fostering collaboration between both the open access and Wikimedia communities. And now, specifically, he's working on a project um, to signal when an, when an article is open access um, in a Wikipedia article. And yesterday, he had a session on this, but there were some technical difficulties. So it will be... Um, uh, we're hopeful that he'll be able to um, show some slides of the project, and we might even have a live web link here. Yeah, well, uh, and there also there is the technical difficulty that I didn't have a microphone there, and we haven't stared at the Wikimedia screen for a while, so <laughs> I thought uh, Wikimedians like to look at media wiki uh, pages, and so I'll, I'll bring up a few. Uh, do you have the Lesla page still open somewhere? It wasn't, oh, you could have, you know, there's that such thing as the internet. <laughs> um, so let's look for Wikipedia. Maybe the search engine knows about it. Yeah, so um, I'll show you probably just two pages on, oh, what's this? <laughs> just like that. Oh my goodness. I don't want to do this too often. <laughs> okay, next try. You know, Wikipedia. Um, so there was this article that um, Cameron was showing, and since I'm, I'm a Wikipedian, um, and I do this all in the spare time, like basically everyone in the community, um, I'm really grateful for tools that uh, facilitate the workflows. So for instance, uh, he was talking about uh, someone who uh, uploaded who started the article and uh, there were other people who were uploading the image. I contributed the audio file and while uploading the audio file, uh, I, I noticed well the original source uh, was not in the format that uh, Wikimedia uh, projects accept, for instance. So um, on Wikimedia Commons only accepts basically OGG as the audio file and no MP3 uh, or on any of the other commercial or pro proprietary audio files um, are accepted. And so this one was uploaded on a mat um, manually, but uh, in that time I was already working on a tool that would do this automatically. It would not just upload the stuff automatically, but it would go into a solely database and uh, search for openly licensed articles that have audio or video, because Wikimedia sites had very little audio and video at the time, and then the tool would go convert the stuff into a format that Wikimedia platforms accept, and then make it available through Wikimedia Commons from where we can just easily embed it here. And so uh, this is uh, something that is a workflow that really facilitates uh, the nasty stuff because nobody really likes to upload stuff manually. Um, and, um, and there's many other things. Uh, we are now working on a similar system that does the same thing, but not just for audio and video, but for entire articles, including all the images. So all the images would go into Commons and the full text would go into Wikisaurus. We have demoed this article, this workflow yesterday in that session. Um, and the basic idea there would be, that, let me show you another uh, page. If you just type in WP colon signal, it will bring you to our, our project page. And uh, the, the gist there is, if you have a reference somewhere on Wikipedia, I'll try to make this a little bigger. It's a, big, it's a big fish. We have big fish to fry on Wikipedia. Um, 
So if you see one of these uh, brackets and the number in, in between, uh, on Wikimedia sites this typically means that there is a, a source provided for a certain statement. And the source comes with typical metadata, like there was an author, there was a title, and so on and so on, and they have a number of identifiers that are way too rarely used. We're working on that as well, but that's not the focus here. And in addition to that, um, we are now planning, and that was the workflow I demonstrated yesterday, uh, to add information about the licensing of the article. Because if I'm, um, well, a Wikipedian or even a researcher, I'm, my main work is as a researcher at the Natural History Museum in Berlin, if I'm looking, for instance, for material that I can put in my presentation, I want it to be highly relevant to a certain topic, and I want it to be openly licensed so that I can share my presentation. And uh, there is, it's really difficult to find stuff that ma matches the two, but if you can go to the Wikipedia article and it contains an image, if it's not the English Wikipedia, which allows fair use, and so um, this is not transportable across ju uh, jurisdictional borders. So if, if I find an image that is uh, within a topic of a Wikipedia article, or maybe the corresponding category on commons, then I know it is relevant to that topic and it's relevant it's openly licensed, so I can use it, I can share. And uh, so if we add this information to each and every art, uh, article or source that is cited in a Wikipedia article, that would be very useful. It would stimulate the use. It would people inform that they can do something with this beyond reading. Because, well, people are not used to that. Even people who, who are active Wikipedians sometimes uh, nominate images or so for, uh, that come from open access sources. On, onto Commons, they no nominate them on for deletion on grounds that they come from a scholarly journal. So by definition, has to be closed. No, the world is changing, and um, so we think it is useful to indicate uh, the reusability of the materials that are being cited on Wikipedia, and we want to uh, well encourage discussion around this. We want to provide this to, uh, to the community, and uh, we are now really interested in getting community feedback. Like, do you really want to have? many scholarly uh, research articles on Wikisource? Do you want to have many images from scholarly articles on Wikimedia Commons? Do you want an item for each and every cited um, reference on Wikidata? And uh, would you like to, to use such automated tools? And as a researcher myself, I would say yes, because as a researcher, I'm only evaluated by my research output, basically only by my papers. And uh, so everything else is a distraction. Giving talks at Wikipedia is a distraction. Editing Wikipedia is a distraction. So the more I can automate it, uh, the other things that are not research, well, uh, the more I can potentially kind of achieve in those other areas um, without uh, disturbing too much of my research. And uh, so there is lots of motivations here for researchers and for comedians uh, to think about ways in which we can automate our workflows. And uh, that's why I would also like to encourage the developer community to come forward with ideas of what they would like to do or um, the, to encourage the scholarly um, community more generally to share tools, data, whatever, to work on prototypes, to engage more with hackathons. That's actually something that I learned through activities with the Wikimedia uh, community and the Open Knowledge uh, community. Before that, as a researcher, I had never been exposed to hackathons, but now it's a regular part of my life, and we've even done some uh, at the museum now. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks, Daniel. So now we'll be able to open up for a general discussion. We have about 15 minutes, um, but if you have questions for our panel, please let us know. Peter? Uh, Peter Murray Ross, open activist. That's what we've been called to do. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, I have a question for you. Uh, one of the great documents of this century is the Budapest Open Access Initiative. I re read it and reread it, and it's a marvelous vision, and we are not doing anything like it. There's only one open access publisher in the world, and, uh, not, and that's Wikipedia. It encompasses the vision, which is that everybody is involved, it is meritocratic, it is inclusive, uh, and it aims to liberate uh, human um, knowledge for the good of humanity. What we're doing in open access at the moment is a bureaucratic um, process to glorify 20th century publishing instead of building the communication uh, um, outlets of the 21st century. The current publishers are not democratic, they're not uh, transparent, and they're not inclusive. 
Well, I'd say that I think we've made great progress over the past 12 years. And yes, I, our, I and, agree with that. Okay, and just to give um, background um, to the other participants, the Budapest Open Access Initiative is a, um, is a visionary document which um, we developed in 2002, um, which first defined open access. <clears throat> and as, as more background, um, my, my foundation, the Open Society Foundation, our goal in helping to develop the open access movement was originally to help um, bring the research to the developing and transition countries, which we um, serve. But we knew in order to get that material um, to this audience that we really needed to, to build a global movement and to work on advocating for public access to publicly funded research um, from the world's largest research funders. And so I think that we have seen progress in making that research freely available online. Um, I take your point that um, you know more needs to be done on the publishing side, but I think with Eli and Kloss that we're seeing many um, more innovative pu publishers come along. But as a foundation, we didn't feel like we could invest in the development of the publishers themselves and that has happened organically um, more needs to be done but i do think in the past 12 years that we have seen many advancements and in addition to the publishers of course the articles themselves are available through institutional and subject-based repositories which is a which is an advancement as well now i know ian do you have a direct comment yeah i've got a good response to what you say peter i genuinely completely agree with you and the uh, sort of contrast situation space and culture, in, uh, and contrast that to Wikipedia. One of the big differences, I feel, is that the means of production in publishing space remain closed, and the yes. software and tools for making those production remains closed. Yes. There are two parts in particular that are specifically closed. The first is the generation of XML that's required for deposit, and the second is that we output in PDF. In contrast with Wikipedia, the means of production is completely open. It's an open so software system. It has its open uh, uh, memes around how you use it, how it evolves, and how it moves forward. And there is a movement in publishing to try and create more open tools, but we have a very long way to go. And I think until we get to a point where those tools are fully open and the means of production are available to the community, there's going to be that dissonance, and it's going to remain for a while. So that's, that would be my one comment. It's pre yeah. like first class citizens and not canon. There will actually be a session on the relationship between open access and open source uh, tomorrow. I don't know where, uh, but around the same time. Alma, you have yeah, I, Well, I just to echo uh, Peter's hurrah there. I think, um, Peter, if you want this, and we all do, it's got to go back to the author researcher community. That is where this final shift is going to come from. I don't think you can expect big publishers to turn around because they're not going to. So the innovation and the change has to come, I believe, from the bottom. Policy is fine and it's helping change minds, but the innovation and the change in the ways of doing things has got to come from the authors. So we have to go back to them and start with new arguments, I think, and, and to enable them with these tools or to ask them to develop the tools in the first place. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for the, the value uh, in pushing for good public policy around uh, access to research, because I think it sends a strong signal that's important that open access is the norm, that it's the future, that it's you know what big research funders like the U.S. government or the European Commission um, you know, that funds such a large amount of research expect um, you know of the research that they fund, and I think that can be very helpful uh, in sort of a creating a culture where uh, people are more open to different types of publishing or more open to different models. Uh, to create more fertile ground for different sort of models for publication for all uh, to ultimately develop. Mm -hmm. I think it is important to talk about the model in which open access can uh, And uh, I think there is a wonderful model that has worked very well. The fact that the authors put the, the right rate online. And this is uh, the reason why it develops the web. And uh, I am astonished that uh, and this is about the fact that in inside this world, no. There are some people who put the library online. And, uh, I think uh, it's very important, the responsible of this is uh, the scientific communities. One should uh, uh, push the scientific communities uh, to encourage the, the authors to do an apply. Because, of course, you also need the, the, the 
factory process, which is very important, is expensive. But the publisher, or whoever does this, cannot charge an unfair amount uh, if the fragments are online. And, uh, you just need to have the fragments online to mark that they have been recognized, published somewhere. This is not uh, problem solved. So I completely agree uh, with you. Uh, and I think for those of you that might be newer to open access, there's sort of what, something that's important to understand. There's uh, sort of two types of ways to make an article openly available. You can publish it in an open access journal like PLOS or eLife that makes all their articles immediately and freely available online under a CC BY license. Uh, or, uh, you know, if for whatever reason you have to publish in a closed access journal, um, you can make your article, the text of the article, either the preprint or uh, the author's final uh, version, uh, available online either through an institutional repository, by a subject-based repository like the Archive or NIH's PubMed Central, or through preprint servers. Uh, and that's something that a lot of researchers don't, I think, frankly, realize that they have the rights that they need. Uh, in fact, I think it's something around 70, 67 or so percent uh, of journals uh, allow for authors to make some form of their paper freely accessible. And so I think in some sense, a lot of the problem, at least getting the text of these articles online, uh, is sort of, uh, there's a solution that's right there. It's just that there's not a culture, uh, you know, of authors making these copies freely available. So many don't. A few uh, You're quite correct. They have done it in physics. Um, they started doing it in 1991, and uh, the sky didn't fall in and still hasn't. And we still have publishers publishing journals in physics. I agree with you about this is what I mean about changing authors' attitudes and behavior. They have to understand what this argument's trying to get them to do. They have to accept it. They have to agree it's important, and then they have to do it. And it is a very difficult job to take them through that. Policy, as I keep saying, does help because it underpins changes in behavior. It can catalyze culture change. But it needs to be supported then at the author level by constant persuasion and, and evidence that this is going to benefit them. I think that this is happening in some disciplines. It's certainly happened in some areas of physics, certainly, but not all areas of physics. As if you talk to some kinds of physicists, they, they still go, oh, open access. Um, it's happening in the biomedical community to a certain extent. But then, as we heard Jonathan talking about the human, humanities and social sciences, they, uh, with and notable exceptions. As disciplines, they have not yet kind of bought into this argument and they're still wondering about whether it's a good thing, let alone how and when they might start doing it. So we need more champions like yourself within that community. I think I'll add to that just briefly. There's, there's also the issue of monographs, which I don't think we're going to really go into much, but it's, it's a kind of different and just to put one last point, I think if your sort of goal is culture change, I think that's uh, the right one. And I think it's a perfect argument for why we need to work with students, right? If you want to create a change in culture, you should work with the next generation. Um, from a Wikimedia perspective, um, it actually is important how these things are licensed. So your uh, proposed solution would um, only work for us if the preprints that are put up online are openly licensed and ideally machine readable. And we're not there yet. Um, and so I actually tried to build my bot, I'm a biophysicist, so I, I went to a biological archive, PubMed Central, I also went to archive and wanted to do the same thing. But this is not as easily doable uh, because bas basically there is no proper XML. And um, that, that's it. So um, putting up the, the papers online is the first step. It is necessary, it has to be done, but then we have to think about whether the PDF is actually the best format and what open licensing actually means. I think that's a great opportunity for the Wikipedia community um, to, to increase awareness of licensing rather than just sort of online availability. Um, and I think playing a role there and actively requesting things and contacting academics could be really important. Yeah, so 
so since we're talking about uh, uh, changing behavior and changing attitudes and perception of practices in the social community, uh, in the year that we're sort of shifting the name of practitioners to authors, uh, my obligatory question for everyone who has this panel today that I'd like to ask is uh, what do you think would be the, uh, the single cheapest and most effective way uh, for me as an author to be called to the practices as the uh, best venue? One single idea you should be possible. Cut you from being a feed Yeah. <laughs> I guess so if this is a question that we deal with um, you know, working with students and early career researchers, I guess for my money, um, probably the single most effective thing would be to put promotion and tenure policies in the place that reward openness. Because that's what researchers respond to, and it's something that makes it particularly difficult, I think, a lot of times for early career researchers to, to be, frankly, as open as they'd like to be because they feel the pressure that they have to publish in Science or Nature or Cell uh, or what have you that has an impact factor that's closed because they feel like they won't be able to have the research career um, you know, that they want otherwise. So I think it's incumbent upon research funders and university administrators to you know, create an environment where openness is supported. I think that would be the single most effective thing. Yeah, and I would say recognize it as part of um, career paths, like build it in, basically, whether it's through a research evaluation or through sort of like finding ways of sort of citing um, self-archive material, or there's, there's various other things you can do, but career structure. No more? Um, yeah. Uh, I Thanks to your discussion here. I was interested in picking up on the point about engaging politicians and uh, innovation, talking about innovation. Um, with my own academic background, uh, a lot of the research called the go out, um, you have to demonstrate benefits to the UK economy. Um, you know, if you're a, a client of British institutions. So to me, even the very nature of that is a sort of is a closed approach because you know if, if I'm trying to do engineering work in developing countries, um, I don't <laughs> demonstrate benefits in the UK. I don't quite have to see how that works if I'm working on it a slow sandhill for a you know. So how does that conversation with politicians go <laughs> in terms of innovation, in terms of whether that sort of approach? By its very nature, by its. It goes, dear politician, <laughs> if you help us with a good policy to open up the research created in this country, it will benefit our economy, but at the same time it will benefit other economies too. Don't be jealous of that, just let it go. <laughs> They do get it, um, and they do obviously understand that there's going to be leakage. I mean, uh, to ask you to, to demonstrate how your research is going to benefit the UK's economy is, to my mind, a ridiculous thing to ask you. Um, to ask you to, to say something about the significance of your research in general is, is a much more important question, I would say. Um, but, but you can engage them, and you can engage them by talking about a national economy, but, but to make it plain that really we're talking on a much more global, or, or if not quite global, um, a, a bigger scale than just a national thing. I mean, that's a hideous way of looking at things in this century. Okay, well thank you. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up. But first I'd like to thank Stuart for your leadership in driving the open scholarship um, track here for I think we've seen more open access sessions here at this conference than we have uh, at any once in the past. So thank you for that. And I'd like to especially thank our panel and Jimmy in particular for joining us. And um, thank you for all of your, your questions and participation. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And so to remind you that the next session in this room is Wikimedia 2 grants, and that will start at 11.30.